Hi everyone, Carl Steele here. Second video for English 4101, a medieval seminar. I'm going to be talking about books one and two of Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. Just introducing you to some major themes of this text and some of the biographical information about Boethius and also talking a bit about translation. So the topics we'll be covering uh, in this short video uh, just concern the historical and biographical background of the text, just so you can situate yourself a little easier in it. Uh, some of the key themes, just to help guide you through the text. Uh, some of the binary, some of the strange comments of it, hope that you might've noticed, and some strange th things to say about landscape beauty, which is normally something that maybe we don't give a lot of thought to, but Boethius says some things that are quite surprising about it. Um, also just some comments about why Boethius is so down on fortune, which is something that maybe we modern people tend to desire, but Boethius thinks it's a false thing. And just finally, a brief note on some of the translation choices that you encountered in your reading for today. So just in terms of what uh, the situation is, uh, first off, we have, a, have an image here from a 15th century Dutch manuscript of the Consolation. This uh, is at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, so BNF. It's in Dutch manuscripts, so you see there in French, uh, Nederlandais, that means for the Netherlands. It's the number is manuscript one of their collection of Dutch manuscripts. Every manuscript is an individual unique item, and it's from the uh, reverse side, the verso of the 12th page of that particular manuscript. And this is an image uh, of Boethius lying in bed in prison, uh, kind of a comfortable looking prison with lady philosophy coming to him with a book and about to console him uh, eventually with philosophy. So the period that Boethius is living in and the region he's living in, he's in Italy, sort of dividing his time between Rome and Ravenna, probably has spent some time in Alexandria and Egypt as well. Uh, this is about 400 years though, after Philo lived. Um, when Boethius uh, is in sort of the prime of his, of his life, the emperor in the West, West is a man named Theodoric, uh, who's not Roman, he's of Germanic uh, ethnicity. And he's basically has, um, has the government in Italy. And we don't need to go into a lot of detail about it, except to say that the Roman Empire had split in two. And that the East is centered in Constantinople and the West sort of is being passed around between a lot of different people. And there's also divisions religiously in terms of some very specific things about what they believe about the nature of Jesus and how the Christian Trinity works. And we don't need to go into that uh, today. Um, Boethius, uh, Enicius Manlius Celerinus Boethius is a member of an aristocratic family. He's orphaned, uh, he's born as an orphan, and he's adopted into a family of a very high ranking person in the, uh, in the government. And uh, we know a great deal about Boethius in part because he, he tells us about it in the Consolation. And so he himself, he bemoans his fate and says that he was unfairly accused of treason. And then Lady Philosophy also runs through all the benefits that of Boethius's life about how he was adopted by, by a powerful person, about how his wife is, is admirable uh, and modest and how his sons uh, have been recognized with political power quite early on. Um, and so we, we know that he's an extremely well-connected man, but he's accused of treason and he's imprisoned and he is going to be executed for that. So he's, he's never going to leave pr prison as a free man. He writes this book while he's waiting what he knows will be an inevitable execution. It's part of what makes this work so, and so interesting is, is what we know happens to the person who wrote it and that he knew it was happening as well. Uh, the genre of the work is a constellation. And there's in ancient Greek and Roman writing up through Boethius's period, at least, there's a great many of these works uh, written, as you might expect, to console people who have suffered some loss. What's unusual about Boethius's work is not the mixture of prose and poetry. That's not unusual. It's not unusual that it sort of splits between uh, more emotional appeals and eventually philosophical appeals, because the theme of the work is how philosophy can console you for loss. Uh, the unusual thing really is the emphasis on philosophy, that eventually the work in the last three books especially becomes a kind of philosophical treatise about how everything in this world down here below uh, isn't worth being attached to. That's something you might remember from reading in Philo, and it's something you're going to see in Edmund to Philo as well. But the mixture of prose and poetry 
is, is not unusual for constellations. Uh, and so it's people have tried to say it's something other than what it is, but trust me, it's a constellation. So um, the themes of this work is pay attention to the key binaries of it. Obviously, the main one you're going to see running through this work is reason versus passion. And we saw that in Philo, but you can also track these same binaries all the way through and see which one is aligned with which side of reason versus passion. We've got light and darkness. We get sky versus dust at one point, permanence versus impermanence, fixedness versus motion. And then we can even think about the way gender works on that. So that'll be something we'll talk about in class. Um, I'm also interested in the way that freedom functions in this. Again, we have this idea that, that truly be free means a certain form of submission, but submission to something that's higher than yourself. So we have that line submitting to his governments and obeying his laws is freedom. So freedom is not just the ability to do whatever you want, but rather to shape what it is you want to do in line with what eternity thinks is the best thing to do. And then that is true freedom. So true freedom is following the eternal law. And you're gonna see that the trajectory of the work is heading in that direction. Um, and then you might've encountered this phrase and been surprised by it just as I was. Um, at certain points, philosophy says to Boethius, if you, you have to rid yourself of hope and fear, or she says, rid yourself of hope and fear. And there I, I modified the translation slightly. So there's the original Latin here, timorum spemque fugato. Um, so why do you need to rid yourself of hope and fear? So this is something I'll ask you about on Thursday. Why do you think these two emotions, why getting rid of hope is something that Boethius would have, uh, have you do if you're going to be truly consoled. And then there's this long passage about landscape, and I want you to think about that, because we tend to just look, say, at a beautiful mountain or a beautiful sea seascape and be comforted, and maybe even think this is something that, if we're a religious person, that God made for us, and that it's evidence of God's beauty and God's design for that kind of person. But what Lady Philosophy says to Boethius is that you may delight in these things, but these aren't true sources of happiness because they don't actually, you didn't make them. They're not due to your efforts. They're just incidental and accidental. So when we look at landscapes and so on, Lady Philosophy says, you're enraptured with empty joys. And we can talk about that more also in class on Thursday. It's a very surprising approach to what we might think of as a completely innocent entertainment. So think about abandoning hope and fear, both of them. Think about abandoning your attachment to landscape. What does that leave you with? Uh, so we'll, we'll pay attention to that as we, as we work our way through the entire uh, work. So one of the things you're going to encounter, especially in, in book two, is this attack on fortune. And these attacks on the idea of fortune is something you're going to see uh, throughout the Middle Ages. So for example, Petrarch, who's a uh, 14th century Italian writer, uh, sonnet writer, and a writer among other, many other things, has a work on called On the Remedy of Both Kinds of Fortune. So you might think, well, if you're experiencing bad fortune or bad luck, of course you need some kind of consolation. Why would you need consolation for good fortune? Because it creates false attachments, uh, false connections to things, because it may make you believe that this particular temporary benefit is something that actually is, is worth holding on to. So here's an illustration from that same uh, 15th century Dutch manuscript. Um, we know it belongs to a, a particular Dutch aristocrat, Ludwig von Groithaus, because I think possibly I'm saying his name right, um, because we can see a little bit of his motto here. If you click through on, on the PowerPoint, you can get the full motto, but it's just, it says in French here, uh, plus est, I'm doing old French pronunciation, vous, there is more in you. Uh, and then we have in Dutch writing here, labels of what these people are experiencing on the wheel of fortune. You see fortune has got a happy aspect and a sad aspect. So here she's being happy, good fortune, bad fortune, rotating the wheel, people who are in power, people falling out of power, people at the bottom of their total misery, and they may be rising up, but the wheel is always turning. In a sense, change is always happening, but there's never any real change because you just end up with basically the same system. And that system is one of everlasting, unreliable change, or the only reliability is that people who are in, in good situations will eventually end up in bad situations and vice versa. So we may tend to think that if we uh, work hard, uh, that eventually we'll get rewarded. And that's something that I think belongs to our capitalist era. Uh, for example, um, 
but that is really not what seems to be operating in Boethius' philosophy. If, we, if good things happen to us, they're because of fortune. If bad things happen to us, they're also because of fortune. There's a certain randomness about this. Uh, and we need to find a, a truer value to attach ourselves to and try to find happiness in something other than the benefits or the miseries that, that accrue to us. Um, and so we've posed the question of how can fortune be bad? Well, we can look at the way fortune talks herself at 24, 26, pages 24 through 26, when philosophy speaks in the voice of fortune. And you can see that fortune is just about things that happen randomly. And anything that happens randomly isn't happening through reason. And anything that isn't happening through reason is not really worth attaching yourself to. Ultimately, what this work is gonna be arguing is that rational activity and rational thought are the only things that are really worth doing. So again, should be familiar to you already from reading Philo. Um, and th this is the key question that's going to attack fortune in this work. Do you believe this life is governed by haphazard and chance, or do you think it's governed by some rational principle? And Boethius will say, well, by some rational principle. And then philosophy will say, well, for that reason, you shouldn't give up on all attachment to anything that happens haphazardly or by chance. Uh, you may be troubled that you're such a good person and such bad things happen to you. Philosophy will eventually say, of course, that's just the way fortune operates. Don't be too attached to things. So again, we talked a little bit about how this wheel of fortune suggests that there's constant change but without anything new ever really happening. And I just wanna offer a little footnote on that from an excellent work by uh, Patricia Claire Ingham, who's a professor at Indiana, um, who, whose last book in 2015 is called The Medieval New Ambulance in the Age of Innovation. And in the final chapter of the book, she does a very interesting reading or interpretation of this image of fortune from a medieval manuscript. And she says, well, we tend to, modern people tend to think that medieval people didn't have a sense of the new, but we can complicate that simply by looking carefully at this image. She can say, she says, uh, Professor Ingham says, look at the gear, look at the complicated gear that we have. Um, fortune is spinning, is twisting this crank, which spins one wheel, which spins an even larger wheel. So those of you who have studied physics have a sense of what's happening here, how a, a relatively light force can be uh, upgraded to stronger forces by the use of gears. So that is itself an image of newness. It's in fact uh, a really complicated technology. Uh, also, she looks at the, at the clothing and says the fact that we can identify when this manuscript was made on the basis of the clothing that people are wearing suggests that it's also attending to that new thing, which is called fashion, that you can identify when someone's from on the basis of the clothing that they're wearing. So there's a kind of tension here between a kind of static notion of effort of change that doesn't bring anything new and the newness just of the gears and the clothing. And that's something I think maybe you might, might want to ponder. So uh, last point, and there's a bit of a content note here, because some, some, some really nasty uh, language about women, but you read the text and you encountered this material, and I thought I would just offer some final words about this. So the <clears throat> Boethius wrote in Latin, and the work has been read continuously from the time he wrote it, really through to the present day, mostly in Latin, but as knowledge of Latin has uh, diminished in the modern era, there have been more and more translations of the work, but there were translations of the work in the Middle Ages and into Old English and the Middle English and the Old French into, into, into Dutch, for example. Um, and so we have this uh, phrase when Lady Philosophy comes on the scene and she chases away the muses. So Boethius is involved in the kind of self-pity, basically of reading poetry that's just making him feel sad because he feels sad. And so he wants to basically listen to sad music and read sad poetry, uh, which, which a lot of us do. And uh, Lady Philosophy chases them right away and calls them hysterical sluts. And I just, I hit that and I was like, this is a really ugly piece of language. It's really, I don't like this. I don't like the way this makes me feel. So I just need to compare this to other translations and to the original. So another person named Walsh translates it in roughly the same year, 1999. Um, Watts was originally written in 1969, he revised it. Um, and he translates that same phrase from Latin as harlots of the stage. And that gives you something closer, I think, to what Boethius actually says. And let me share some other translations of that particular phrase. Queen Elizabeth I, uh, it's the Queen of England when she is in her 60s. 
She translated Boethius not very accurately, but very rapidly, just to kind of show that she can do it. And she translates it as these stagey harlots, stages, stagey harlots, which is kind of nice. Um, Chaucer in the 14th century, it translates it in the Middle English. Uh, these common strumpets of switch a place that men clep in the theatre. These common strumpets of such a place that men call the, thea the theater. And so he's he's translating it in a slightly more wordy way because partially the Latin is a little bit strange. And here's what the actual Latin is, uh, Seneca's Meritriculus. Uh, probably the best translation of that is little theatrical horse. Meritricula is a diminutive of the, of the Latin meritrix, which means a, a courtesan or a prostitute. Um, but it's interestingly, or sadly, that word meritrix is connected to the Latin uh, verb merere, to earn or to merit or to purchase. So arguably meritrix uh, means a woman who earns money. There is something really troubling and upsetting then about the Latin word for courtesan in the way it attacks any, any independent woman. So that's maybe something we could think about the way gender is working in this, in this work. And I think when we encounter a, a kind of savage moment of really nasty, I think, misogyny in this text and it's put into the mouth of lady philosophy who's a woman, and we could think about how do you, how do you translate phrases like that when you encounter them? Uh, what's the best way to do it and how should you contextualize it? So we'll talk about that a bit in class as well. And I will see you on Thursday.